in the next few months. So I'm really delighted to chair this book event with Ariella Gross. As some of you may know, we were trying to kind of uh, hold this event for a while now, starting in last March, and we kept delaying it with the hope to have Ariella around in Tel Aviv and actually in the hope of having a real a physical event in which we can actually see each other face to face rather than in boxes. But eventually, uh, at some point, we had a hope that uh, Ariella will be able to be with us in Tel Aviv today, but things became squeezed in time and the procedures became longer and longer. Uh, so we ended up having Ariella in LA and Yael in Berlin and Tamar in Boston, etc., and many of us around here. Steve Wilf, I see here, and some others from different parts of a different continent. So I'm really delighted to be involved in this book event because uh, Ariella is a real friend of the Faculty of Law of Tel Aviv University. She came uh, on various occasions to visit us in different formats, and she has many friends and colleagues on the Faculty of Law. Some of them are here today. And I'm also particularly delighted because uh, our friendship goes back many years. I'm not sure how many more than one like to mention, but uh, I visited USC for a term at some point in this century, I think it was. Uh, uh, Ariel and I spent a year, a full year together at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Science in Stanford not too long ago. And during that year, I was exposed to the book manuscript in the making and realized the value, uh, the originality and the uniqueness of this book. Given the fact that the history of slavery is so well researched, uh, I was surprised uh, uh, and uh, impressed by this new take and new insights that were provided by the book. But it's not my role here to evaluate the book or to discuss the book I'm just to share today. Uh, so I'll briefly uh, introduce her really a little bit more formally, uh, Ariella uh, Gross is the John B. and Alice R. Sharp Professor of Law and History and the co-director of the Center for Law, History and Culture at the University of California uh, Gould School of Law. Ariella received a BA from Harvard University and a JD and PhD in History from Stanford University. Uh, she visited various institutions, including, as I mentioned, the Center for Advanced Study in Stanford when I was fortunate enough. Again, her research and writing focus on race and slavery in the United States. She teaches contracts, history of American law and race and gender in the law. And she is the author of three books and the editor of a few other books and the author of many articles. So I just mentioned the authored books today. Uh, double character, slavery and the Mastery in the Antebellum Southern Courtroom, published by Princeton some years ago. We won't mention the year I was advised. Uh, and the award winning What Blood Won't Tell A History of Race on Trial in America, uh, published by Harvard University Press some years ago. And most recently, last year, just uh, as the uh, uh, pandemic broke out, uh, Becoming Free, Becoming Black, uh, uh, Black which was published. Uh, by Cambridge University Press in the flagship uh, series in legal history sponsored by Ameri the American Society for Legal History. Uh, the book is co-authored, was co-authored with Alejandro de la Fuenta, the uh, Robert Wood Bliss Professor of Latin American History and Economics in Harvard University. Uh, so uh, this is Ariella. The book will be introduced by her in a couple of minutes. Uh, I would like first, before moving to Ariella, to thank the David Berg Foundation Institute for Law and History and its director, Roy Kreitner, uh, and the Minerva Center for Human Rights and its director, uh, Leo Abilski, for sponsoring the event. And, for, and I would like to thank Orich and Lev for taking care of the early parts of organizing this event, and Rachel Clarksborn for organizing it all the way through up until today. Thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, the format of this evening this event uh, will include first an overview of the book for the sake of those who did not have the opportunity to read it yet uh, by Ariella for about 15 minutes, followed by discussion of the book by three 
respondents providing different perspectives on the book, each of them for 15 to 20 minutes, hopefully 15 rather than 20. Uh, this will leave some time for questions from the audience. And the last word will be Ariella's when she will respond to, res to the discussions, to the questions and conclude the evening. It's a relatively late uh, hour of the day in Tel Aviv, not in LA. In LA, it became more reasonable time today, thanks to the delay, but in Israel, it's relatively late. So I'll be using this, uh, the advice of El de Toledano, I'll be using this, mentioning you uh, the fact that you are approaching the deadline so that we'll be able to conclude the event on time. Uh, I'll uh, present the respondents as we go. So the first respondent, the first discussion, to be El Toledano. Uh, professor El Toledano is, the emeritus professor, is an emeritus professor in the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel University. He was the director of the Program for Ottoman and Turkish Studies at the Department of Middle Eastern and African History and the head of the School of History. Uh, professor Toledano received his PhD uh, from Princeton University, conducted extensive research uh, uh, visits in Istanbul, London, and Paris, uh, visited some other institutions, uh, and he's the author of numerous books. I'll mention three that are most relevant for today. The Ottoman Slave Trade and its Suppression, 1840-1890, Slavery and Abolition in the Ottoman Middle East, uh, uh, and as if silent uh, and absent, bonded enslavement in the Islamic Middle East, and as I mentioned, these are only three of the many books authored by Eld, and we can already realize the perspective from which he'll be approaching the book, the perspective of slavery outside the Americas. So Eld, the floor or the Zoom is yours. Okay, um, so, but, but actually one thing that I will do a bit different is to uh, actually have a, a different perspective than the one that is expected. Do you not want me to to sorry i kind of yeah yeah i, <laughs> I was supposed to yeah <laughs> I, book I thought it was yeah. ariella's turn it yeah wasn't... i think it yeah. is ariella is going to talk for half an hour and then we're going to attack her i mean that's that's the whole thing <laughs> you can change your perspective Eld, after listening to ariella absolutely <laughs> Um, I won't talk for half an hour. I'll keep it. I'll keep it shorter than that. Um, do I have the ability to share a screen? Can you make me a co-host? Rachel, do you do this, or should I? Oh, now I'm a co-host. That worked. Hang on, uh, one second. Now it's really I stuck my uh, uh, stopwatch now. Okay, did that work? Yes. You can see my screen. Um, okay, great. So um, I want to start by thanking um, the Berg Institute and the Minerva Center, um, but also my dear friends, Ron Harris and Roy Kreitner, Leora Bilski, um, of course, uh, Rachel, um, and uh, and of course, the, the commentators, Yael, Ehud, and Eli. Um, I really wish that I could be there with you in person right now. Um, you know, we as we kept postponing this event, um, the crises kind of uh, extended and multiplied, um, but the life of the mind continues, um, and I'm especially grateful for the intellectual and affective uh, ties that bind me to the Tel Aviv uh, University community. It's an interesting moment to be um, talking about the history of law, racism, and race in the Americas. Uh, here in the US, public attention has been focused on this history more intensely than I can remember in a long 
time. Um, we have legislatures banning the teaching of critical race theory in schools and a lot of public attacks on the New York Times 1619 project for suggesting that racism and slavery are at the center of US history. Um, quite a few critics on both the right and the left have challenged the connections between the American Revolution, racism and slavery. Um, and the age of revolution is key to our book. So um, what I wanna suggest is that the great promise of liberty that came with the age of revolution also came with the entrenchment of race and racism in the law. And hence our title, Becoming Free, Becoming Black. Racism is pervasive across the Americas, but it was especially in the new US Republic that freedom and citizenship became so closely tied to whiteness. So our book tells the story of enslaved people who took advantage of openings in the law to claim freedom for themselves and their families and overcame extraordinary obstacles to do so. They worked overtime on Sundays and late at night to earn wages to purchase their freedom, found lawyers to help them bring lawsuits for freedom, took depositions from white neighbors or family members attesting to their hard work and good character. The book is a legal history that focuses on the way ordinary people made claims on legal institutions and participated in legal processes that shaped the institution of, slave, of slavery and created regimes of race. Um, we chose uh, three places, Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana. Um, all three became full plantation slave society roughly contemporaneously, although each is settled at a different time. Um, we have a Spanish colony, a British colony, um, as well as a hybrid society, Louisiana, that began uh, French, uh, became Spanish, and ended up American. Um, and the key questions that we ask in the book is why it is that in all three of these places, colonists from Spain, Britain, France, that, who all begin by putting into place in the law um, distinctions based on African descent, equating African descent with degradation and slave status. In fact, even earlier in Havana than in New Orleans or in Virginia. But by 1860, they look totally different. A free person of color in Havana can be part of public life, but in Louisiana or Virginia is being excluded from public life. So why um, does that happen? And our answer is that the law of freedom determined these different regimes of race. And the story begins with legal traditions and in particular, the fact that the right to become free is never limited in Cuba and never tied to race, but it didn't end there. The book also shows how important were the initiatives of enslaved people themselves pushing on the law to carve out new rights. And we show that the politics of white men's democracy in the US Republic where enslavers had to appeal to non-slaveholding white people made the position of free people of color especially precarious. And we identify the age of revolution as a key moment in which, in that divergence, not in the way you might expect, um, uh, in some ways, it's a moment where freedom's expanding all over the Americas, but key differences are already developing. And in the long run, communities of free people of color attain significant numbers in Cuba, while those in Virginia and Louisiana did not keep pace with the expansion of slavery. So the books divide into three periods. I'm just really giving a super quick snapshot from each one, um, as I said, across the Americas, uh, slaveholding elite in the colonial period, of, you know, roughly 1500s to 1700s, begin the process of legal race making as soon as they arrive. But in Havana, they have a head start. Um, the Spanish colonists arrive and they can draw on Iberian social and legal precedents regarding slavery, um, local ordinances in slaveholding capitals like Sevilla um, that either 
uh, subsume negros in the same legal regime as enslaved people or specifically target free people of color. Um, in Louisiana, uh, French colonists arrive in the early 18th century with decades of experience enslaving Africans in the Caribbean, and they bring with them a code of laws that had already been shaped by the French experience as enslavers. Um, the Louisiana Code Noir, or Black Code of 1724, by its very name, connecting slavery to race and building racial distinctions in law, um, also incorporated modifications of the 1685 code based on the last few decades of um, the colonial experience. Um, Virginia colonists also created a racial legal regime that closely associated blackness with enslaved status, but its creation was slower and more fitful because of the lack of precedence. Um, so, we look in particular at the eastern shore of Virginia, which had um, a, a significant population of uh, free people of color um, and where key issues were not yet resolved regarding um, the status of uh, enslaved people, including whether uh, baptism would make one free, whether enslaved status would pass through the father or the mother were not resolved in the 17th century. Um, uh, things that were already clear in, uh, in the Spanish colonies. And I'm just gonna rush uh, through the examples here. Um, but, but to say that the key difference that develops um, uh, by the first quarter of the 18th century between Cuba on the one hand, Virginia and Louisiana on the other, is that in both Virginia and Louisiana, the right of an owner to bestow freedom on a slave and hence the right of an enslaved person to claim freedom is severely cut back in the first quarter of the 18th century, but never in Cuba. And uh, the practice of coetacion, the legal uh, uh, practice of creating self-purchase through um, a kind of installment plan, um, uh, which of course happens on the ground in uh, Virginia um, and, and indeed across the Americas, but it isn't backed up um, by legal enforceability um, in the British colonies as, the, as it is, uh, or French as it is in the Spanish. And um, and so uh, not only does this bind the owner to emancipation once she has paid the remainder of the price, um, but it becomes a basis for, uh, for, the, for various ancillary claims and important ones uh, uh, that, that coartada um, people come to claim are um, ownership, for example, of the of, um, uh, the fetus in the womb. This is a contested right that is fought over. Um, owning a fraction of one's labor. So for example, saying I have paid half my price and now I should um, receive wages for half of my time and that should go towards my purchase price. And the notion of um, pedir papel or carrying paper transferring this right to purchase so that um, even, for example, um, kin and, uh, for, and uh, social networks in the community of free people of color could pool money to buy um, the, the remainder of, pay the remainder of the price and the owner would have no choice but to sell. Um, so all of these kind of customary practices um, eventually, uh, you know, become uh, a part of the law as um, uh, as people claim these rights um, uh, over the course of, of the period we're looking at. Um, okay, then comes the, the age of revolution, um, a turning point when we see people of color across the Americas claiming freedom in rising numbers, the populations explode in all three jurisdictions. The example of the Haitian Revolution inspires the enslaved as it strikes fear 
and the enslavers. Um, but the expansion of freedom meant something very different in the Spanish Empire and the US Republic. Um, the communities of people of color in Cuba and in Spanish Louisiana, which had changed hands in the early um, uh, uh, in 1803, um, owed their existence to legal, I'm, I'm sorry, in 1763, it becomes American in, in 1803. In 1763, they owe their existence to legal understandings and customary practices that are anchored in traditions of the old regime. And slaves who managed to purchase their freedom become members of highly stratified societies where black freedom didn't imply social equality or Republican rights. Um, by contrast, in Virginia during the age of revolution, the expansion of manumission and freedom suits is tied to questions of citizenship and black participation in the new political order under conditions of equality. And so we see um, in the, the late 18th and early 19th century, this explosion of freedom suits and claims um, by uh, in Virginia, free people of color in Virginia using every um, loophole in the law, often using um, uh, stat, you know, statutes that were never meant to expand freedom, but they find um, ways to, to do so. This is one example of a, of a Virginia freedom suit. Um, and Virginia's white citizens witnessed those trends with horror. They petitioned to outlaw many missions to remove free people of color from the Commonwealth and even uh, from the United States. And after Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831, um, that uh, intensifies sl uh, slaveholding states in the South, respond to threats of rebellion and to Northern abolitionist demands for immediate emancipation with the defense of slavery as a positive good. And Southerners cement white solidarity by defining citizenship and voting rights along racial lines so that egalitarian democracy goes hand in hand with the expansion of racist practices and ideologies. And that's really why colonization efforts that sought to remove free black people to a distant location in Africa prosper in 19th century Virginia and Louisiana, which becomes part of the United States um, in 1803, becomes a state in 1812, but not in Cuba. In Cuba, um, there are these very limited deportation efforts, but free people of color continue to play an important part in militias, confraternities, and other aspects of public life. And that's also why Virginia and Louisiana act in the 19th century, especially in the 1850s, to end the possibility of manumission, self-purchase, or freedom suits. By 1860, free people of color in Virginia and Louisiana are increasingly forced to leave the state upon emancipation or live under threat of prosecution. And so a few even uh, petition for exemptions in Virginia for these onerous laws through this loophole of, of obtaining a, a certificate as not a Negro, I, a, being a free person of color, but not a Negro in order to um, avoid the laws. A handful even chose so-called voluntary re-enslavement uh, in order to remain with family rather than being uh, rather than being deported. I'm going to wrap up. I see my my sign. Um, Free people of color continued to claim freedom in court. They fought tenaciously for basic rights to a homeland, to remain close to friends and kin, to live in their communities of origin. In Louisiana, they even continued to draw on Spanish legal traditions to make claims. And this is an example, uh, uh, Francois versus Lebrano of a case where in 1843, an enslaved man in Louisiana claims uh, that, first of all, that he's purchased uh, himself through a coartacion contract. And, uh, and this is 40 years, right, after the end of Spanish rule, um, and that he owns five eighths of himself uh, because he's paid five eighths of his price. So uh, the kind of claim that might succeed in, in Cuba, but 
but totally fails in Louisiana. But, but amazing how that legal knowledge has remained in the community. Um, I, I, again, fast forward here. We end in 1860, uh, by, the, by which time Cuba had diverged significantly from Louisiana and Virginia, not in its legal regime of slavery, which was extremely similar, but of race and racism. The initiatives of enslaved people were as important as legal traditions in this trajectory that they took advantage of legal reforms not intended for their benefit to carve out greater freedoms for themselves. And in that process, communities of free people of color were key. And in the United States, laws regulating free people of color also serve as the template for black codes, for many Jim Crow restrictions, and for immigration laws in the 19th century. Um, this is an example of, of, uh, of you know, a cartoon um, as that was part of the campaign that led up to ch the Chinese exclusion laws. Those statutes echo into the 20th century and to the present day in limits on the right to immigrate into the U.S. based on racial and national identity. In Cuba, on the other hand, legal racial barriers came under increasing attack even before final emancipation in 1886. In the 1880s, limits on interracial marriages are eliminated. Racial segregation and public services and education were outlawed. And as the colonial state of Spain sought to retain control over the Cuban colony, it had to cultivate the political support of the free black population. So, so again, the difference between the empire and uh, the republic is important. Um, and, and I will end there. I'm sorry for going a little bit over time, but I'm really excited to, to hear your comments and thank you all so much. I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much, Aurora. It was just fine. We have no problem, I think, with the timing. So we'll move straight to Ehud. As I already introduced Ehud before time, we can move straight to you. And as you asked, I'll show you a sign after 12 rather than 15 minutes. And... That's fine. Uh, just to say a word about the um, perspective. So I do come from uh, this region in terms of uh, studying uh, enslavement. But ultimately, uh, the current project that I'm working on is a trade book. And it's not for professional historians. And it sort of leads from these areas through uh, work I've done on global enslavement into the Atlantic world and ultimately ending up in the United States. So uh, I will say a few things. I think it's a wonderful book, as I will say also as, as we go along. But what my contribution might be here is to show how people with my background as social historians, sociocultural historians, uh, will, I think, read the book. So for more than a century, the study of enslavement has, in, has formed a major branch of social, economic, and political history, as well as in sociology and anthropology. Given the volume and major role played by slavery in the Atlantic world, it is not surprising that servility, especially in the US and Brazil, has dominated the first decades of writing in the field. Although a number of studies were dedicated to Greek, <clears throat> Roman, and other empires in antiquity, as to medieval European and non-European bondage, the bulk of the output and often the methodological sophistication have been produced in early modern and modern Atlantic enslavement. The high numbers enslaved in the antebellum South, the fact that the available sources for research readily lent themselves to economic and quantitative analysis, uh, their quality and the keen interest by African-Americans as by students of post-emancipation US history have all accounted for the outpouring of research in the first writing cycle, which still persists today, although to a reduced extent. A similar trend is noticeable in Brazil, where high demand for scholarship on the heritage of enslavement and race relations has yielded a larger number, uh, I was surprised to find that, that out, a larger number of works than in the US, although the overwhelming majority of these is still uh, accessible only in Portuguese. Only a decade and a half ago, Cooper, Holt, and Scott dated the beginning of, and I quote, the enormous interest in comparative slavery, unquote, as they put it, to Frank Tannenbaum's Slave and Citizen, 1946, an interest which 
peaked, uh, as they say, in the 1960s and 1970s, end of quote. They added that, and I quote Tannenbaum's uh, book, as well as Stanley Elkin's Slavery um, in 1959, and several others used comparison to make a point about contemporary United States, end of quote. That, of course, was the meaning of comparison at the time, namely between North and South America, still well within the world of Atlantic enslavement. Another small trace of comparison can be noticed in work done on the US South versus uh, enslavement in antiquity, in antiquity. However, only from the second half of the 1990s, global scale comparative work began to include non-Atlantic enslaving societies, among them Muslim majority ones. An important move in, the direction, in that direction has been the publication of the canonical Cambridge World History of Slavery in three volumes uh, in 21, there will be the fourth one, uh, during the 2010s. The book before us is a wonderful addition to the Atlantic comparative tradition bringing into the debate a somewhat neglected discussion about how the law was reflected and reinforced in the history of enslaved people in the Latin Caribbean and the English and French speaking uh, and, and Spanish also part of the time US South. The book seeks to examine the different approaches to black enslavement between Cuba, Virginia and Louisiana from the early modern period well into the 19th century. The approach combines legal with socio-political history and looks at the two different paths the status of enslaved Africans took in Cuba on the one hand and Virginia and Louisiana on the other. So my comments will center on relatively minor aspects, especially adding the perspective of a semi-global historian of enslavement coming from work on the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean worlds with special emphasis on Islamicate societies and the period covered more or less by the book being reviewed here tonight. First, the comparison in the Fuente Gross work falls squarely within the Atlantic world, mostly between the US and Latin America and hence not part of the growing body of knowledge involving the MENA region, Africa, Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent. This of course is fine, but to an Islamicist, it appears as a missed opportunity of sorts, given that much could be gained from pointing out the number of important similarities and influences, especially those that seem to me at least, to have filtered through Muslim Spain into the Spanish laws governing enslavement that are so beautifully outlined in the book. This clearly comes to mind when manumission, but also in other aspects discussed in the book, manumission is being discussed in uh, Cuba versus the US uh, South. To begin with, enslaved persons in the lands ruled by the Sharia, Islamic law, were aware of their rights, in quotes, because of the big debate whether the, these were rights or not legally, and went to court to demand that enslavers respect the requirements imposed on them in treating the enslaved. The fact that the enslaved had to sue against the infringement of even the basic manumission regulations shows that many enslavers wanted to keep their enslaved women and men longer or in violation of agreements and binding commitments they had entered into. Enslaved persons in Muslim majority societies challenged in court their unlawful enslavement and in almost all cases, if evidence could be produced, usually through testimony, the plaintiffs would be liberated. El Ali, mentioned in the book, whose case is cited in the book, was freed after being kidnapped in Louisiana and enslaved, as was also common under Sharia. Our authors quote a statement in the file to the effect that, and I quote, according to El Ali's witnesses, Madame Porsche had wanted to set all her slaves free at her death, but realized, quote, it was useless for her to make any last will in which all her slaves should be set free because witness knew that the police jury would never permit its execution, end of quote. In Sharia rule domains, one of the most common forms of manumission was setting free specific enslaved persons, regardless of numbers, after the enslaver made known in public her or his wish that those persons be liberated. It's called tadbir in Arabic. 
uh, disputes occurred when heirs denied that such declaration was actually made. And if witnesses could not be produced by the enslaved, no manumission would take place. There are, of course, not a few other legal similarities and differences with Cuban uh, il evolving law that might be considered by the authors or other interested scholars for future research. Another point that attracted my attention is one of the drivers uh, that one is one that derives uh, from a sociocultural historian's point of view when looking at an historical explanation driven by a legal approach. Thus, the authors write that. And please notice the order of things here, that this is the important thing I want to put. And I quote, legal traditions, enslaved people's actions, imperial institutions, politics, and the twists and turns of history all shape these differing, uh, tra differing uh, trajectories. And end of quote. My own list of same factors would look something like this. And this <clears throat> enslaved people's actions, imperial institutions, politics and the twists and turns of history as reflected and shaped by legal traditions all shaped these differing, differing uh, trajectories. So from my perspective, the authors appear to take for granted the, and I, in quotes, primacy of legal space, which I borrow from Barbara Johansson, long discussion about that with him. Uh, Sharia is norm and practice driven incorporating customary law or, or ADA in Arabic as one of the main sources of lawmaking and the four plus schools of legal thinking or madahib in Arabic were from their inception to the present essentially regional, reflecting the major role played by local knowledge uh, in shaping Sharia uh, law and practice, local knowledge as, as Gears defined it and I will be using some of Geertz's views in, in the, in, as we go along, but without mentioning them. So, so everybody who knows will recognize it. So instead, or rather in addition to the legal line of thought, I would ask, what is the value system that reflected and anchored those legal traditions? Was Cuban society less color conscious and othered and other than objectified Africans or dark-skinned people to a significantly lesser extent, and if so, why? Was Cuban society, therefore, also more open to rehumanize enslaved Africans and integrate them into society? The, also, the authors put the entire burden of the process on the ability of the enslaved to find uh, the legal precedent or trick that would mandate society to liberate them through the courts. Um, I hope I'm not getting this wrong. So Ariela, you know, you will comment on it as I go along, as you go along. Um, that rather than ask what changed socially in Louisiana and specifically in New Orleans that made society and the elites go along those diverging legal avenues. I would think that it is a matter of explanatory hierarchy, the difference here in, in approach, or perhaps the genealogy of the explanation rather than trying to downgrade the importance of the legal explanation. This leads me to the final point, which might perhaps appear uh, as the most controversial. The authors assert that, and I quote, it was not a society's recognition of slaves' humanity, nor its racial fluidity that marked the differences among Cuba, Virginia, and Louisiana. It was how successfully the elites of that society drew connections between blackness and enslavement on the one hand and whiteness, freedom and citizenship on the other end of quote. They then conclude that, and I quote again, by the early 18th century, the legal regimes in all three jurisdictions constituted blackness as a debased category that was equivalent to enslavement. So to me, blackness as a debased category is way too weak than what took place out there. Whereas in Virginia and Louisiana, citizenship and whiteness became inextricably intertwined. This is the end of the previous sentence that I was starting to quote. These divergencies, Fuente and Gross argue, resulted from, quote, the different trajectories that the law of freedom took in these societies. It seems to me that the authors stop one step short of saying that white Southerners othered, objectified, animalized and in fact dehumanized 
Africans, that dehumanization enabled you. So that, you see, this is the perspective of sociocultural history. That the dehumanization enabled humans to commodify other humans, exploit, abuse, and enslave them. This certainly occurred also in other societies and cultures before, including Islamicate ones, where Sharia defined enslaved people as speaking animals, al hayawan and natiq But in, order, in, in other societies, as in, ca in the case of Cuba, the same original view still left an open path albeit narrow and full of obstacles to rehumanization, liberation, citizenship, and re-socialization of black and brown people. That dehumanizing system of meaning, here it's again, in the South, had no room for free uh, rehumanized blacks, only for enslaved ones. So they had to be physically purged out of visible space and obliterated from mental space as well. You see, I, I know these are harsh words, but I don't think that's this, this, this in any way off the, what happened out there. Uh, thus, what Chief Justice Roger Taney described as the perpetual and impassable barrier between the races, and the authors argue it was a barrier of race, was actually, in my view, the barrier between human beings and other living animals. To Southern culture, this was part and parcel of, parcel of their ethos, their worldview, the very essence of what their society was and what it was not. Southern society refused to rehumanize blacks after abolition was forced upon it and sought successfully to reverse it in many ways, beginning with the 13th Amendment, failed reconstruction, Jim Crow, state and federal court decisions up to the Supreme Court, and the legal structure that enforced them. And to cite the authors themselves, and I quote, laws limiting the rights of free people of color have echoed in the black codes in a host of facially neutral but racially discriminatory laws from 1865 to the present and in the racial logics that still inform much of our legal system. The struggle against civil rights, the Civil Rights Act uh, and its implementation feeds directly into the systemic racism that we witness today. It feeds on and is nurtured by the dehumanization of blacks and their enslavement. Arguably, in my view, there was no rupture between anti and post bellum, but more of a continuity. All that oppression and exploitation had been enforced with a tremendous amount of violence, uh, the kind that enabled all enslavement systems during the early modern and modern periods in the Northwestern hemisphere, including um, Islamicate uh, uh, societies. That violence created in turn an atmosphere of fear and terror where dehumanized individuals and their communities were denied the most basic element of human existence, safety. It was socially of all, all kinds of safety and there's no time to, to really uh, go into details here, but safety. It was socially and culturally anchored even when the laws said otherwise. Thank you. Thanks very much, Awood. As you promised, you shifted the attention from the Middle East and the Islamic world further into the US. And I'm sure that Eli will continue the same line the same environment. So I'll move on to introduce him, Eli Aronson. Eli is a professor at the Faculty of Law of Haifa University. He has received a PhD from the London School of Economics, an LLM from New York University, and MA uh, dealing with the history of ideas from Tel Aviv University. He was, among other things, an Alon Fellow. His scholarship employs this. Uh, historical, sociological, and comparative perspectives to explore the political underpinning and social consequences of criminalization and penal policies. His first book, From Slave Abuse to Hate Crime, The Criminalization of Racial Violence in American History, was published uh, by Cambridge University Press in 2014. Uh, I think that Eli is very well placed to continue our discussion of the book. The floor is yours. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so the publication of a new book by Riella is always an opportunity to revise our understandings of the slavery era and its legacy. So I'm very grateful to Ron and to Ariella for inviting me to share my thoughts and to participate in this conversation. 
And I would like to begin by saying that this is a truly remarkable and inspiring book in terms of the richness of the archival research, the flow of the historical narrative, and the far-reaching implications of the argument. It is a book that demonstrates the fruitfulness of exploring the formation of slave law from the bottom up, combining an analysis of how political elites design legal rules with an, with an investigation of how actors experience and encounter such laws on the ground. It is a book that illustrates that subaltern actors can sometimes contest the legal mechanisms that were specifically designed to deny the right to have rights. And it is a book that provides a wonderful illustration of the power of historical and comparative inquiries to eliminate uh, the variability of the institution of slavery that is so often portrayed in monolithic and essentialist terms. In my talk today, I will try to locate the contribution of the book in the context of uh, historiographical debates about the place of law in the political culture of Southern slavery. And I will also try briefly to raise some questions uh, about uh, the political and epistemological challenges of working with slave law archives, uh, questions about the navigation between national, translocal, and global uh, scales of analyzing slave regimes, uh, and also questions about the continuities between uh, the slavery and post-slavery periods in American uh, racial history. So there is a long tradition that portrays legal rules and institutions as capturing a marginal place within the political culture of the American South. And we, we will focus today on the slavery era, but I will just mention that this kind of characterization of the South and, and the focus on the anti-legalistic creeds of Southern culture continues uh, well into the second half of the 20th century, maybe as, as Ehud implied, uh, earlier, maybe uh, some forms of you know, sublimated violence that the legal uh, system in the, in the South continues to inflict on African-Americans today are part of this history that goes back to the slave patrols and to the lynching. Now, this perspective describes the ways in which uh, plantations operated as legal black holes during the slavery era and emphasizes the distinctively Southern traditions of using extra legal rituals of lynching or dwells to solve conflicts and punish wrongdoers. Important studies further suggest that to the extent that legal institutions did play a role in the slavery system, this role was mainly confined to the facilitation of the daily functioning of the economic system in which enslaved individuals could be bought, sold, or mortgaged in accordance with property and contract law doctrines. Over the past decades, however, we've witnessed a serious reassessment of the role of law in Southern culture. One stream of revisionist writing has sought to identify elements of doctrinal coherence and humanist sensibilities in the law of slavery. And as again, I'm echoing Ehud earlier, this is mainly in, at the level of formal law rather than law in action. But nevertheless, we have interesting studies that, that look at the internal logic of, of the law and, and find a, a, a humanistic sensibilities in, in Southern legal doctrine. This literature has suggested that the development of Southern law was driven by pressures to reconcile its own doctrinal contradictions rather than by its functional role in the service of slaveholding elites. But it had relatively little to say about the ways in which ordinary people had experienced and encountered the law and negotiated the meaning of the law in everyday life. The current book builds on several decades of research that has sought to remedy this lacuna and to recover the forms of legal practice and legal consciousness that uh, slaves, slaveholders, and non-slaving slaveholding whites had developed during this period. This literature has shifted the emphasis of the analysis from questions concerning the law in the books to inquiries about law in action, and it demonstrated how aspects of legal indeterminacy, human agency, and the tensions between race-based, class-based, and gender-based systems of social stratification created cracks in the law that sometimes enabled slaves to negotiate and contest the power relations to which they were subjected. Becoming Free, Becoming Black makes many contributions to, to, to this literature, and I would focus on two of these uh, contributions. 
First, it places the laws regulating free people of color at the center of its inquiry. And by doing so, it offers an insightful empirical and theoretical assessment of the distinctive governance and ideological roles that such laws performed. This analysis improves our understanding of particular areas of slave law, such as the jurisprudence of manumissions and inter interracial unions. But more importantly, from a theoretical vantage point, this focus illuminates the unique contribution of these laws to the Sisyphean effort of Southern society to define the nature of slavery by placing it in contradistinction to its concept of freedom. The second contribution of the book is that it demonstrates how bottom-up approaches to the study of racial slavery can be utilized to advance a comparative investigation of how different slave societies shape the relationship, the conceptual relationship between racial identity and political freedom. By taking a comparative and translocal scale, and I'm using uh, the, the term translocal rather than transnational because I think it better fits uh, the colonial period and, and some of the features of, of, of the case study, the book shows that even though slave holding elites in uh, Virginia, Louisiana, and Cuba shared political goals and governance concerns, they differed in their ability to institutionalize the, the inferior status of persons of African descent. In their explanation of these differences, Gross and De La Fuenta take legal precedent seriously and show how they shaped past dependent trajectories of legal development. But they also demonstrate that the impact of such precedents was mediated not only by macrostructural political forces, but also by micro practices of resistance by enslaved individuals and free blacks. One of the most insightful lessons of this comparative frame is that it helps to challenge Whiggish understandings of the development of racial regimes in American history. By highlighting the contrast between the relatively benign racial laws that emerged in early colonial Virginia and the more formalized measures that settlers in Cuba and Louisiana were able to establish based on the availability of Iberian and French models, and by following the differential trajectories of these regimes during the next centuries, we get a clear picture of how the pressures that the slavery system experienced in certain tr transformative periods, and particularly I think the, the, ante the, the discussion of the ante antebellum era is uh, instructive here, urged political elites in Virginia to reverse benevolent trends and enact repressive measures that were not available to their Cuban counterparts. Now, in the reminder of this comment, I would, I would try to, to raise uh, three points uh, for, for, for questions and discussion later on. The, the, the first point I wish to uh, raise grows out of the recognition that the research tools and thematic questions of legal history, like those of any other academic discipline, not only enable, but also constrain our ability to understand the past. And while the focus on legal texts and legal conflicts reveals insights that are often neglected by historians who focus on studying plantations, slave patrols, informal slave markets, and other components of racial slavery, we should also reflect on how the focus on those aspects of slave society that were translated into legalistic forms and successfully underwent the processes of naming, blaming, and claiming that serve as preconditions for the elaboration of legal disputes bring us to emphasize some aspects of the Black experience at the expense of others. And these questions resonate with the critical reflections raised by Walter Johnson in his discussion of the, the uses of the concept of agency uh, in social history of slavery, and in Stephanie Smallwood's uh, reflections on, on the politics of the archive and history's accountability to the enslaved. And these reflections present the fundamental challenge of slavery research as that of grounding the historical narrative in the documented material while steering clear of reproducing the epistemic silences that are built into the slavery archive as a result, a result of the processes of violence that constituted its, its formation. So the first issue I would like to uh, raise for discussion is to ask Ariela about how you and Alejandro have uh, navigated these difficulties while conducting the uh, research and whether there are strategies and methods by which one could uh, address the inherent limits of the slavery law archive. 
The second point uh, relates to the scale of the inquiry and the position it takes vis-a-vis uh, -vis historiographical approaches that emphasize the importance of using a global scale to study slavery system. And here I think I echo some of the uh, observations that Ehud made uh, earlier, uh, but my point of reference was interventions actually in, in, in American history, such as Thomas Bender's A Nation Among Nations and similar works that argue that what is often seen uh, as a distinctive problematic of American history was actually part of a broader contemporary movement toward abolition in other co continents uh, and regions. Uh, now, of course, th these global perspectives have their own limits. And here, maybe I'm, I defer with Ehud. I see in my study, in my historical study about transnational legal ordering of criminal justice, you always have these dilemmas of whether to adopt a global versus transnational versus regional uh, scales. Uh, and there is, a, there is criticism of, the, of, of, of this kind of you know, a, a global a perspective. For example, the question of, of whether this kind of history is successfully mediate between macro level and micro level processes of historical change, or whether they uh, can uh, meaningfully use a, a concept of causation and, and explain cause and effect. So I wondered whether, to what extent the methodological choice you made in this book, the decision to, to work in these uh, frames of uh, comparative and translocal uh, scales, to what extent it, it reflects uh, this kind of criticism of, of global histories of uh, uh, slavery and how the similarities and differences that the book identified within the regional context of, uh, of the Americas interact with uh, global patterns or, or deferred from, from global patterns. My third and final point uh, relates to the important observation that the book makes in the concluding part in arguing that the legal instruments regulating free pe people of color in the slavery era provided templates for racial control measures in later periods. Now, the empirical substantiation of, of this claim lies beyond the, te the temporal frame uh, of the book that ends in the 1860s, but I thought that this is one of the most far-reaching implications of this study because it offers new ways of tracing the genealogy of a wide range of racialized policies that are often understood as products of the post-reconstruction era. So in the field of criminal justice, for example, much of the scholarship that examines the historical roots of current predicaments, such as the pervasive use of racial profiling and policing and the racialized denial of political participation through felon disenfranchisement laws, focuses on their post-reconstruction uh, precursors. And I think that the analysis developed by uh, Ariella and Alejandro in this book provides opportunities to rethink some of the assumptions of this perspective, because it reminds us that although the challenge of reinforcing racial hierarchies within a constitutional order that presumes formal equality among free citizens gained particular prominence in the post-reconstruction era, these governance concerns had clear origins in the context of regulating free people of color during the slavery period. So this is probably your task for, for the next book uh, or the next article, but I'm curious to hear a bit more about uh, how you perceive these continuities. Are we speaking about specific uh, legislative templates? And, and I think that in your presentation, you, you mentioned one example, uh, which was very interestingly, uh, took, took it to the context of, of anti-Asian and, and anti-Chinese sentiments that uh, uh, took root in, in the United States in the late 19th uh, century, but I was also interested, of course, in the continuities in terms of uh, uh, African-American uh, uh, history. Um, or are we looking at actually at more overarching conceptual frames of racial governance, such as the discursive focus on the relationship between black freedom and perceived uh, black dangerous that many historians have traced uh, to the specific circumstances of the formation of the Jim Crow systems in the South or the reaction in the North to the migration of African Americans uh, to Northern uh, cities. So I think that your analysis actually offers an entirely new terrain for a uh, look at the genealogies of these uh, uh, racialized policies. And I would be interested to hear more about uh, how you're going to proceed uh, 
uh, this line of inquiry. So by way of conclusion, and once again, this is a wonderful book uh, which deserves much praise and warm congratulations to Ariella for this seminal contribution. Thanks very much, Eli, for the fascinating comment and for keeping in time. Uh, before moving to the last uh, uh, reflection on the book by Elston, I just would like to remind you that you'll be able, we'll have time for probably a couple of questions uh, afterwards. So those who wish to ask questions can use the raise hand feature of Zoom or just send me a chat. And so now turning to Yael, Yael Sternal uh, teaches, uh, Professor Yael Sternal teaches in the Department of History and the Department of English and American Studies of Tel Aviv University. She has a PhD in history from Princeton University. She held the prestigious Hanadiv Fellowship and Martin Buber Society of Fellows Fellowship. She was until recently a member of the Israel Young Academy. This year she is a fellow of the Wissenschaft Kolleg in Berlin from where she will be talking today. Her first book, Roads of War, The World of Movement in the Confederate South, was published by Harvard University Press and won some prestigious prizes. She's currently working, I assume now in Berlin, on her next book, War on Record, The, Arch the Archive and the Making of Civil War History, 1861-1901, which is under contract with the University Press. And I won't try to guess what your perspective on this book will be. I'd rather let you take it by yourself, yes. All right, um, thanks everyone. Uh, it's nice to see people. I've been pretty checked out for the past year or so. So it's good, uh, it's good to see many familiar names and uh, faces. Um, and thank you for the invitation, which has allowed me to delve deeply into this remarkably smart and important book. Becoming Free, Becoming Black tackles what is in my mind the largest possible question in the history of the new world. How was the racial category of blackness created? And not only does it boldly take on this question, it seeks and largely succeeds in providing a straightforward answer, the law of freedom. As the co-authors put it, and uh, I think this quote has already appeared, um, although free people of color were few in number compared with enslaved people, and they lived on the margins of three plantation societies in many ways, the contests over their identities, status, and rights formed the terrain on which race was made. So I learned a great deal, both from the transnational or as uh, Eli just called it, translocal, which is a, a great term that I'm going to steal. Um, I learned a great deal from the comparison, uh, which really works here, I think, to make a substantive point and from the detail oriented discussion of all free society. I appreciated in particular the fact that the authors dealing with such a complex question did not run away from the complexities and did not fail to point out those places where the facts did not align neatly with their argument. The infinite diversity of the human experience uh, never can fit, of course, perfectly into one story, even when that story is fundamentally right. So I will frame my brief remarks as a series of questions, uh, all of which will betray the fact that is known to all of you that I'm not a legal historian. Uh, and first I'd like to use this book as a means to hash out the most basic question my students and I ask about the law of slavery, which I teach every year in the introduction to US history. And then I'm going to try and put this book in conversation with two of the themes historians of the long Civil War era have been debating in recent years. So first, to put it as simply as possible, um, what is the relationship between law and culture? Now, um, I'm not gonna put it that simply, I will explain. The authors argue forcefully that it was the law of freedom that made race. But what made the law of freedom? Law is not an independent agent, but a product of human action. At times, the law appears in the book as having a life of its own. Across linguistic and imperial barriers, the law constituted Blacks as social outcasts, the author writes, conflating their social existence and enslavement. 
legal prohibitions that applied to all black men and women, free or enslaved, or defined certain actions by any black mulatto against whites as a crime made blackness rather than enslavement the mark of degrade, degradation. So legal traditions, especially Iberian law in, Cuban, but to, in Cuba, but to some extent also Roman law in Louisiana, figure prominently as determining forces in shaping the law of freedom in different cultures. But even these traditions, in order to maintain traction in the daily life of individuals and society, require human beings to uphold them and to shape life in the new context of the Americas. Was it really that simple, considering the fact that the prescriptions of these laws were created elsewhere and in very different circumstances? At times, the authors actually are quite specific about who made laws. They use a few different words to describe these individuals, elites, power brokers, slaveholders, even legislatures. Every once in a while, a particular name of a lawmaker or planter comes up as playing a particular role in the formation of these pieces of legislation. But I wonder where, whether there is more to say about how these legal regimes came into being. I was hoping to ask Ariella uh, more about the process and the agendas that fed into it. Were the interests of powerful whites always aligned in each of these three societies? Were legislatures also planters necessarily? And thus did the legislation reflect not just ideas about race, but also the very particular interests of those making money from black debasement? How did material circumstances influence the formation of these racial categories, both in terms of the actual legislative processes, but also as a reflection of broader conditions? Which leads to my next question. There are important differences between Cuba and the United States in creating racial categories, and I am persuaded that they were both expressed in and emanated from the law of freedom. But there's also a great deal of similarity. So maybe to try and turn the question at the heart of the book upside down, I wonder what can we learn from the fact that three regions with three different legal traditions, and in some cases, considerable variety in forms of enslavement, actually ended up with pretty similar, though hardly identical, of course, racial case systems. Was there ever really a different path for societies mixing European settlers and enslaved African workers? Once those African workers arrived enslaved from their native lands and Europeans arrived equipped with superior technology and Christian convictions, could a radically different social order have emerged? This is a question that I've often thought about and discussed with my students and, you know, I like all of us arrive at different questions, at different answers uh, at different times. And as I finished reading the book, I felt the answer this time was no. And I'm wondering what Ariella thinks about this. Now for some thoughts on this book and the historiography of the 19th century in, in my field of social, cultural, political history. So the book tells the story of numerous individual acts of freedom whether by enslavers or the enslaved. I would like to think of this in conjunction with the debates over the collective, the mass emancipation in the United States, which ultimately took place, as we all know, in 1865, once the Civil War was over and life in a post-slavery, post-war era began. In recent years, historians have all but deconstructed the standard narrative of this moment in United States history, or as Carol Emberton has defined it, they are unwriting the freedom narrative. They have argued that the experience of emancipation was harrowing and dehumanizing for many, if not most African-Americans. They have focused on the mistreatment of freed people by the Union Army, on illness, on hunger, on death in the camps where refugees from slavery crowded, and on the tragic breakup of families that took place once men, women, and children set out on the road. Emancipation now appears in the literature very much as a continuation of slavery rather than a break. This is also, in many ways, how a lot of historians, not everyone, but I think it's 
probably more common uh, than not. Um, historians of Reconstruction see life in the South in the post-war era. The great revolution of the 13th Amendment seems anything but that. And so I came away with two conflicting thoughts about this ongoing debate as it relates to this book. The first was whether we as social cultural historians have become so focused on the miseries and the indignities inherent to the process of wartime emancipation that we no longer see law as a vehicle of change. The fact that the law of slavery not only changed but came apart altogether seems to matter less than the fact that women were still losing children, not to the slave trader, but to the hunger and cold of the South's bleak refugee camps. This book was an incredibly useful reminder that law does matter. And so how do we bridge this gap between legal freedom and the lived experience of African-Americans undergoing the transition to freedom? But then on the other hand, what the authors seem to be saying at the closing of, of their book, and I agree, the conclusion is particularly powerful. You're saying that the legal systems already in place in the United States when millions of African-Americans became free were so restrictive and discriminatory that the move in 1865 was, as you put it, not from slave to citizen, but from black to black. And so I'm left with this question, and uh, I really am really curious uh, to hear what Ariella says, has to say about this. Um, how do you see the tension between these two poles of interpretation of, of your argument? Now, another way in which this book, uh, I find, is a in very interesting conversation with some recent literature on slavery and its demise is its image of slaveholding as a gendered experience. The authors convincingly show that female slaves were manumitted more frequently and that more often than not, they were manumitted by female slaveholders, whom the author guess freed their slaves, who they freed their closest servants. Now, some of the most exciting work in the history of slavery uh, in the last decade plus are books revealing the full extent of women's involvement in slaveholding. I'm talking uh, about Tavolia Glimp's uh, 2008 book, not the recent one, but um, her previous, Out of the House of Bondage, which offers a tantalizing view of slaveholding women as cruel and violent mistresses and of the household as a battlefield between white and black women. The violence of slavery was not restricted to the field or to the men who managed work there. It may have actually been, as Klimf contends, more vicious in the enclosed spaces of the big house, more systematic and unrelenting when employed by white women, who are also, of course, victims of oppression, but were never the kind of moderating influence on their husbands, as we have been taught to believe by a previous generation of scholars. More recently, Stephanie Jones Rogers in They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South takes this one step further outside of the household and into the public sphere. She has discovered women, widowed of course, but also married, taking an active part in the business of slavery, buying and selling slaves, managing plantations alongside their husbands or all alone. These were women who profited from slave-based capitalism and built their wealth on the backs of enslaved workers. At times, as Jones Rogers shows, they may have been even more fervent about and committed to enslavement as outsiders to the system they had been let, they had been let into. So what accounts for these different visions of female slaveholding? The first and obvious explanation, of course, is like I said at the outset, the, the endless variety of the human experience. Historians are trying to counter the image of the gentle Southern woman, a slaveholder against her will, an image, as we all know, that um, started with plantation literature and was solidified in Gone with the Wind um, in ways that are pretty um, intractable. But that does not, it preclude the existence 
or what I'm trying to say is that the fact that historians are doing this critical work now of um, excavating the female slaveholder in all her cruelty, it still does not preclude the existence of strong ties between white and black women. Female friendship is a mighty force, as we all know. And I can easily believe that it developed even under the extreme conditions of enslavement in some households, and then led to the liberation, to the, to the manumission of particular enslaved women. But another explanation, and probably a better one, may actually be tied to the process traced by this book in which blackness became identified with enslavement. Female manumission figures early in the book when manumissions were still relatively common. Did female slaveholding become more abusive as time went by? Were female slaveholders less inclined to free their slaves in the 19th century because there were no longer legal mechanisms that enabled them to do so? Or were they less inclined because they could no longer see the women they enslaved as deserving of their freedom, regardless of whatever effective bonds may have been developed? Now, that brings me back in a kind of circular fashion to the initial question I raised. Did the law of freedom change because ideas about slaveholding changed? Or did ideas about freedom change because there were fewer and fewer African Americans who embodied and legitimized them? That is, of course, a largely unanswerable question, as these dynamics are always mutually reinforcing. But I still think we ought to ponder them, especially since this book seems to be making a bold claim about the role of law in making society rather than hide behind the always easier claim of dialectical influences and processes. And though um, I, I uh, tried to, to stop myself from doing it, uh, I, I do want to end with a word about the context in which we are having this discussion. I don't expect an answer, but I do want to ask the question. Will Israel's 2018 nation state law have a similar impact? When it was passed, a popular argument was that it was largely symbolic and won't actually change much in what is a fast paced process of integration of Palestinian Israelis into mainstream Jewish society. Now I've gone back and forth on this question in my own musings on this deeply painful topic. And I do not want to sound too apocalyptic, but I do wonder whether what I can take away from this book is that the legal framework created by the nation state law will doom Israeli society in the same way that the authors tell us that the law of freedom doomed the United States. Thanks very much. Thanks, Yael. Uh, your very last question is a question that Leroy and the Minerva Center uh, heavily occupied with in recent months, I think. Uh, but let's turn to the book now and see whether there are any questions from the audience. If there are, just raise a hand or physically or through the Zoom system. Ron, do you want me to, to answer any, any of those or wait for other questions first? So I'm not sure. I, it's getting late, so we probably people are reserving their questions for other opportunities. That's what I'll do with my question. So I think that we'll turn to you, let you uh, respond to these intriguing comments and reflections and questions, and you can wrap up at the end of your responses and uh, we'll call the day. Um, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give some responses. These are really wonderful and provocative comments. And I do hope if other people have questions, they can jump in after me. I won't talk for a long time, um, uh, but I'll, I'll go in order. Um, and uh, uh, thank you to Ehud for a, a really interesting comment, putting this in a, in a very uh, broad perspective um, and uh, and I think it's um, undoubtedly right that um, you know the Muslim influence on on Spanish law is significant, and of course um, you know there are many aspects as well of of um, Roman law that we can see um, uh, in, 
you know, long, long afterwards uh, in these uh, in these discussions. Um, I, I certainly and and uh, you know, just this is in general, since this came up both in your and the else discussion, you know, absolutely um, want to say that, you know, I certainly agree the importance of, of local knowledge and of the social and cultural is, um, is undoubted. And I'm, sh and I think, you know, part of the challenge, I think, for us of going beyond uh, uh, one location is, is the ability to um, use the extent of, of non-legal sources that I have in, in, you know, that we have in earlier work, um, where, it, I, you know, what's something that's more micro-historical, it's more possible to do that. Um, but, um, but I want to push back on the notion that um, that uh, the racist ideology or, or, or culture or color consciousness or humanization or dehumanization is um, is a, a, a real explanatory factor here um, in a, uh, in the differences um, uh, between Cuba and elsewhere. Um, it, I, th what you describe as the dehumanization of black people in Virginia and Louisiana, I think we can, we can see um, in Cuba as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, that the kind of scientific racism um, that, that uh, takes root in the, mid 19th century um, is is strong among Cuban slaveholders as well. Um, and indeed their their antipathy to free people of color and the wish to remove them. you know the um, we, you know we quote for example one um, uh, now I've lost the page, but you know uh, one, um, uh, official writing, you know, it, it would be, you know, this population is very inconvenient. How can we remove them entirely from um, from Havana? And, and they're told, you know, that's not possible. Um, it's not politically possible. And um, it it's not, uh, they're not able um, to do what they wish they could do. And so um, it seems to me less about um, Dehumanization or rehumanization. I'm not sure. I I um, I think it's right that becoming free means being rehumanized. And I think there, you know, um, uh, what Yael is talking about, right? The the limits of of what being free means um, as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure. I, I uh, like both of you. I agree about the lack of rupture between anti and post bellum um, periods, but I I see this less as about um, uh, different views of humanity or uh, different forms of of racist ideology, and more about politics um, and uh, and law. Um, uh, than I think maybe you do. Um, so uh, Eli, and Eli um, uh, raised some, I think, very interesting um, questions. Um, uh, and in particular, this idea, which I think is so important of thinking about the politics of the archive, the silences, what makes it into the law. And I've been very um, interested in, in the work um, that you know, talks about the archive of slavery as a tomb, right? And I think one of the I think to me, one of the benefits of, of doing legal history is I don't think it is a tomb. Um, I, you know, we are able, in fact, to hear um, 
some of the, the voices of the enslaved that we don't always hear um, in other sources. And, uh, you know, I think some of the techniques of reading against the grain that, that um, scholars have used to, uh, to try to hear those voices um, can be used with legal sources as well. Um, I have somewhat of the same reaction to that notion as I, you know, as I did to Orlando Patterson's notion of slavery as social death. And, and I hear, you know, I think I'm very influenced by um, Vincent Brown's work. And, um, and to me, instead, it seems to me that, that what we're trying to do with legal history is recover a form of the politics of the enslaved and that long war on slavery and to see these the this these legal claims in that in that context and so um in that sense um you know i see this as part of a global story but but you're right that we didn't try to write a, a global history um one thing that we did try to do was find, you know, try to ask, is it possible to raise comparative questions while in a transnational frame? So, you know, still t attending to all of the, um, all of the ways that people and ideas are moving between New Orleans and Havana and, and as well as um, Richmond and, and the Eastern Shore of Virginia. But, um, but we were, you know, very aware that these, um, that they're not kind of existing in a vacuum. Um, but of all of these types of, of approaches, um, trans, national or global, I think we think it's comparative that has actually been kind of the most, um, you know, put to the side in recent historiography. And so it was really an experiment to see, you know, is it possible to bring these micro historical kind of uh, tools and archival work to those comparative questions? And um, uh, and I love the idea of translocal, and I too am gonna steal that. I think I think that's really great. Um, you had another uh, point I I was gonna make. Um, um, oh yeah, you know the 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 point about going forward. I mean that is very much what I'm um, thinking about uh, about now, and and uh, and. I think that can, you know, it connects to the issue that that Yael raised, um, and and maybe this is also linked to the um, slavery, uh, the archive as a tomb. But the the point about kind of the focus on suffering and um, and the the heaviness of, um, in particular, uh, the post. Uh, emancipation period. And um, I see that very much in my students. Um, I think that's very strong right now. If you like Elizabeth, Isabel Wilkerson's cast book and and all of the focus on the, the 13th. Some of that, I have to say, I think not what you're referring to, Yael, not the wonderful work that's being done on the Civil War era, but some of the work on the 13th Amendment and the new Jim Crow, some of that is a is a, a historical kind of flattening of history. And, um, and, uh, and a, but a lot of what I try to do with my students is recover the sense of reconstruction that, you know, as a revolution, even an unfinished one. I mean, I think it's really um, uh, uh, so. So I think that is a place where legal history can bring a reminder of the kind of lack of total static. So I do see all of these continuities, but I think it is really important, uh, especially for our students to, to remember like, how unbelievable the, you know, amazing the period of reconstruction is violent and, um, but also, you know, 
the the scale of office holding and politics and you know is is incredible it, even more so looking back um so the 14th amendment in particular i try to, to i taught a class on the 14th amendment i try to bring some of that out and and to me for my students from this book the important thing really is look at the scale of legal knowledge and um you know i I agree with Walter Johnson. I know the problems with it, but the but yes, the agency, the the um, ability to use the tool, you know, to use the master's tools, um, are is remarkable. Um, what what people were able to do, and and um, and so, um, you know, I I suppose I do. Um, I do think it's important um, to recognize uh, that aspect of um, of the legal history as well. So maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll stop. Oh, the last point, the point about uh, women, um, I I think is is a really important one as well. Thank you for bringing that out. Yeah, El. Um, it it seems to me that what we really see there, right, is um, the connections between intimacy and abuse, right? The, which we have oh, have thought about a great deal when it comes to sexual violence in, in the context of slavery, but now we've also think about in the context of relations between enslaved and enslaving women, um, which may not include sexual violence, right? That there can be the, the greatest intimacy as well as uh, you know, yeah. abuse. So could, could I j just follow yeah. up? Um, and, sure. and so does the fact that this appears earlier in the book mean that, that your sources point to the fact that this was mainly a 17th, 18th century practice and that you just don't see it later on? Or is this just how it's situated within your body of work? Yeah, it's to, no. It, yeah, it's not a cha story about timing, really. It's not. A, it's not a story about a, a change over time. You continue. We continue to see that pattern. Um, uh, but I, I think it is about that's really. Right? That's really important yeah. and interesting. Ex right? You know yeah. that that slavery expands and freedom expand at the same time, right? So yeah. That, that this, you know, that um, it could be absolutely true that the same person um, who, right, can be vicious with um, with someone she's enslaving can also be giving freedom to some. And and also, I think really important is that one of the things we found is that. It's a majority among women as well. A majority of these are not by grace; they're self-purchase. So they're economic arrangements that are beneficial to the owner. Um, to the extent we have economic, you know, economist studies of self-purchase prices, they're they're market prices. They're getting a good deal. Okay, so that actually that explains a lot because what it means that what these female owners were actually doing is somehow allowing these favored slaves or there's this one story and I forget his or her name who talked about key slaves in, in each uh, large householding, um, in each large uh, slaveholding household. Um, anyway, so these female mistresses are allowing these particular enslaved women to make to make money right and that's how these manumissions are that's how they become possible yes okay all right yeah, that, that, have, I think that explains a lot actually yeah um yeah they are they're taking in laundry they're keeping gardens and going to market Right, so that's the link between household servants and the ability to right. self-purchase. Right. Right, rather than grace. Right. I yeah. mean, I mean, it may be in some cases, right? Yeah. There are, you know, other kinds of ties, but 
but the yeah, so in, in that way it is in line with uh you know with stephanie jones rogers right because it's it's the slave holding woman as a sound businesswoman rather than a compassionate 19th century victorian lady right um yeah and i think even you know if you go back to um well, what's her name? Suzanne Lebsack, Free Women of Petersburg, you know, because she had been one of the early uh, women's historians to suggest that it was women were freeing um, uh, enslaved people more often and that women were, do, you know, in their wills, for example. But, but a lot of what she was showing was just that women were economic actors more than we thought of them, that, that women who were widowed weren't remarrying so that they could maintain control over their funds and, and make these, uh, you know, make these uh, economic choices. Um, I hope what you're thinking is not true about uh, Israel's law. It's hard to look at what's going on and, and not fear for the result that you're, um, that you're, uh, for, for telling. Who knows, right? But thank you so much to all of you. It's really, it's a really interesting comment. Give me a lot to we think could about. Go on for much longer, I think this is really an inspiring book in many respects and in a variety of directions. But it, it, it's almost 9 p.m. in Israel, and people had a long day and have their other evening time commitments. I think that we'll stop here. I would like to thank Rachel for organizing this, the three uh, discussants, Eud, Eli, and Yael. And obviously, thank you, Ariela, for writing this wonderful book. and. Hopefully, we'll see you in Israel not too long and continue the conversation. So, good night, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.